So <laughs> that's good. Okay, awesome. So what do I do when I'm not writing grants? Uh, so I've been working on uh, prostate cancer projects, looking at immune cell phenotyping and exposure to um, microenvironments formed from benign cells and metastatic cells. So that's kind of in the data collection for paper stage. We're also doing some metabolic imaging with the Scala lab that's actually turning out some pretty cool results. So hopefully that story will be um, complete in the summer and we can get that published. Uh, the project I'm going to talk to you guys about today is the T-cell trafficking in lymphatic endothelial vessels. It's been a collaboration with Max and Patrick. I'm also involved in PERC, uh, where we're looking at the stress response and the immune response. So the good news was the grant was funded, so that's great. Uh, so we've been trying to get the study up and running, so I'm modeling an acute stress response at the moment, but we have now hopefully hired some tips. <laughs> and uh, so when he's starting, hopefully I can then start to, um, to move away from that response and, and some other stuff. And also, uh, Megan and I have been dabbling in some um, CD8 T cell functional studies in response to um, the adrenergic system. Okay. So, so much antigen diversity, so few T cells. So if you think about the way that the adaptive immune response works, so you have cells that are, are they have their T cell receptors that are engineered to, to respond to one particular antigen. So when you think about the potential different combinations to cover all of these many, many different antigens, it's believed that there's between 10 to the 13 and 10 to the 15 different potential combinations. So the way in which we actually achieve this receptor diversity is through this BDJ recombination system. So it's kind of modular, so we can sort of put together different combinations of these genes in the variable region of the T cell receptor, and then this is how we form our antigen specificity. However, if we were able to have one T cell for each of these potential 10 to the 15 recombinations, that would be about 500 kilograms of T cells, and there's just literally not enough room. <laughs> so they reckon there's about 100 million different T cell phenotypes in a healthy younger person. Sadly, I'm probably skating down from this number now. But you know, a healthier person is about 100 million different ones. So because of that reason, there's only a few thousand naive T cells for each antigen because we just don't we just don't have enough room. So if you think about that, you've only got a few T cells of a specific antigen for each of these particular antigens. So in order for your body to actually see that antigen and mount an immune response, if you come into contact with it, circulation is very important. So with circulation of the cells, they circulate through lymphoid organs, and there they're exposed to different antigens, and it gives a chance to actually mount this response. So the highways for this transportation are blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. So if we think about transendothelial migration, um, it's been described as early as the 19th century. I find this kind of fascinating that people who wrote with like feather pens and by candlelight actually could do, identify correctly all this different science. So they actually first published transendothelial migration in 1824. So the process is now pretty well, um, pretty well understood for um, vascular endothelium. So essentially the blood cells roll along the vessel this is mediated primarily by the selectins and their ligands. Then we have some signaling, and then they begin an arrest. They stop on the blood vessel, and this is mediated through um, integrate pairings. So then the adhesion becomes stronger. They can kind of crawl along the vessel a little bit. And then finally, they can either go um, through the endothelial cells, or they can actually do trans and actually go through the cell itself to get out. So, in terms of um, lymphatic vessels, T cells can migrate through the lymph node prior to recirculation, so they can um, migrate from, they can, yeah, so they can either go from the blood circulation into the lymph node through high endothelial venules, or they can enter the afferent lymph, and then they can be carried along to the lymph node where they can then enter the lymph node. There they have their chance to interact with antigen presenting cells, and then they can traffic out through the afferent lymph and go on their way and surveillance. Now, in contrast to our understanding of transendothelial endothelial migration in vascular endothelium, it's really not well understood in lymphatic endothelium. So here's the same diagram. So maybe the selectins have a role in rolling. I'm not totally sure. Clever one is another um, cytomucin that's been um, postulated to have a role. The mannose receptor. There's some chemokines involved. 
probably some integrins involved, and no one has a clue what's going on over here. So this is kind of um, an area where people just don't really know a whole lot about this. There's not really any, until maps, there's not really any particularly great human lymphatic endothelial models. Most of this has been done in mass here, and it doesn't always translate to human. And if we're actually interested, in 1652, Olaf Rupert actually correctly identified what the lymphatic system did. He was a, a scientist in about seven or eight different disciplines and became so famous that Swedish kings have actually been crowned on his grave. <laughs> so he figured out what lymph did. So the lymph model, Max and Karina have um, basically developed this model. So how many of you all know Luminex, the lumens, they're um, primary lymphatic endothelial cells, positive cells. And we can form this nice endothelial uh, lumen and they have all of the markers they should have for um, being lymphatic endothelial cells. So uh, this collaboration kind of started with um, Max and then because Patrick sits right beside us and everything we suggested, he's like, I have a device for that. <laughs> so uh, the three of us have been had a good collaboration on this. So what ideally we wanted to do was model each step in the migration process in these human lymphatic vessels. And then we can start using blocking antibodies or genetic manipulation to try and target some of these receptors and identify <coughs> which of these receptors actually have a role. So initially, um, we looked at stimulation of vessels. So the majority of literature out there that looks at trafficking, you need these sort of stimulated vessels. So here in the top row, we have vessels that were not stimulated. Here in the bottom row, we have um, cells that were stimulated with TNF. And what we see is that stimulation with TNF um, actually upregulates a lot of these receptors. So clever one is this um, lymphocyte endothelial um, adhesion molecule. Um, is upregulated strongly, the matter receptor is upregulated, and also our, ICAN, our integrins, ICAN and VCAN. So we normally stimulate all of our vessels to, to look at this response. Um, also, I think, interestingly, if you're in a cancer situation, then these are probably more representative of that. So here's some data from Max to show that the vessels themselves can actually produce chemokines that can attract um, T cells. So they produce CCL21, which is a known uh, chemoattractant, CXCL12, and also the CX3CL1 called Fraspan, which is actually massively produced by the, the lymphatic vessels. So they are producing cytokines that attract, um, attract these cells. So we first started starting to model the intravasation steps. So the cells are entering into the lymphatic vessel, um, where they're there going to flow towards the lymph node. So we, we've tried quite a few different things. So here we tried putting CCL21 inside the vessel, and they seemed like they were able to sort of start migrating across. Unlike neutrophils, they're not highly migratory. It turns out they don't make proteases. So they can't actually kind of clip their way through the collagen. They have to sort of change their cytoskeletons and try and squeeze through it. So we may run into some issues with the collagen density here. So this was a standard double lumen device, and we thought, hey, it's just really too far for them. So Max made a narrow double lumen device. It's only 250 microns between these lumens. So if we stimulate the vessel, um, you know the cells don't really go anywhere. If we if we don't stimulate the vessel, once we stimulate the vessel, there was a little bit of migration, but not much. If we gave them a chemokine, so here we have another vessel. They're coming towards. We got some migration through the collagen, but nothing entered this other lumen here. And then if we stim everything, so we've stimmed our, our vessel and we've stimmed the, the T cells, you can see the T cells just kind of activate and go into a big ball and they don't really um, traffic there. So what we've noticed is we see migration into the collagen, but we can't really get them to enter into the vessel. They just don't seem to want to, to get into the vessel. Naive cells respond to chemokine and the activated cells don't respond as well. So this is just really kind of... Um, Quantifying this, so if we TNF, TNF stimulate the vessel, we see more migration toward it, um, and then we, we kind of lose this if we don't have the, um, the cells. And again, um, yeah, longer migration times don't help. 24 hours for us doesn't really seem to make much of a difference. So we thought, well, maybe based on some data other people now have seen, cells migrate better once they've been inside and into the limit. So perhaps they would um, be changed by the ability, if they migrate out of a humic lumen, they would be more migratory toward the lymphatic lumen. Sure. 
<laughs> so, we've also tried, uh, we put them in the lens loom and we plopped them on top to see if that would help. No, it doesn't. We put them on the porch, they just sat there and laughed at us. So finally we said, okay, we're going to embed them in the collagen surrounding the lumen. That way they're going to be super close to the lumen. We've given the lumen TNF, we've given it cytokines. This is their absolute best chance to migrate, to migrate in here. And we were very excited because here when we took a Z-stack on the Nikon, through from the top of the lumen to the bottom of the lumen, lo and behold, we can see cells inside the lumen. This is great. Finally, we cracked it. We tried all these different things. And they seem to respond really well to the cocktail. So, pessimist that I am, I said, okay, let's do some cocktail called <laughs> microscopy. Because, you know, let's just make sure that what I'm saying is really in the lumen is really in the lumen. So thanks to Jose for help with the Concoco. But unfortunately, <laughs> I guess the channels, and let's just be a warning to all of you, the channels and knife are a little bit offset. So even though you think you're see stuck in the vessel and then you're looking at the fluid, you're not. Because when we put it in the when we put it in the Concoco, we can see the cells are very close to the vessel, but they're not making it inside, they're just kind of getting stuck on getting stuck on the outside there. It's an awesome picture, but and um, they're, they're not what we think we are. So controls, they are, they're good things to do. <laughs> so why is this? It, are we running into this collagen barrier when we pull out the rod? We kind of have this barrier of really tight collagen they just can't get through. <coughs> are they missing the lack of basement membrane or supporting cells that would be around the vessel? Is the chemokine grading just too difficult to establish that we're just flooding the system with chemokine and they're just unable to, um, to go? Are we not using the right team accounts? Um, also with the protease thing, are they just not um, are they just not able to make it through? So the hardest lesson in science for me personally that I've had to learn is knowing when to give up. Because sometimes you spend a lot of time and effort and you just get to a point where you can spend more time and effort and you could go on the next year or two spending more time and effort, but realistically, is it gonna get you the goal you want or are you better spending your time somewhere else? So Different lesson, uh, difficult lesson to learn. Uh, it doesn't mean it's your fault, it just means that sometimes things aren't designed to work and we can spend our time elsewhere. So unless after this presentation people convince me otherwise, I think at this point we're probably gonna drop the intronization because we're really just not able to model it as well as we hoped. And I think there's other places we can spend our time better. So we are looking at leukocyte rolling. This is one of the devices that Patrick has, these Mac of devices that he opens up and pulls it out when you need something. So this is a device that has a fluidic resistor in it, and um, it's sort of over like this kind of petri dish of media here, and it can create flow where you can basically create flow throughout the device. So we can add our cells, and then they flow through, and then they basically enter this resistor. So this allows us to model rolling. So here are some calcium labeled T cells, and we can look at them rolling along the along the vessel. So you can see that a lot of these cells are flying by. But then some of these guys are going kind of slowly, these are the guys that are rolling, this guy is actually arrested. So and then they're just rolling down the vessel. So this is actually so it seems to be we can create appropriate shear forces to see this rolling interaction. And then we can quantify these um, we can quantify these cells using a plug-in with image J. So we can get measurements on the number of cells, we can get measurements on the distance and we can calculate the velocity of how fast they're going. So we can do a few different measurements. We can look at the difference of velocity. So for example, here is T-cells rolling on an unsimulated vessel versus C-cells rolling on a TNF-simulated vessel. They, they roll much slower, which makes sense because we've upregulated these receptors that potentially are mediating this interaction. So they're rolling much slower. And this is actually more suggestive that they're going to arrest in their capacity. We can also look at adhesion to the vessel. So for example, if we take naive T cells and we look at adhesion, once we've rolled them, we can just see who's adhered to the vessel. Um, we see um, a number of cells adhering to the vessel after rolling. If we TNF stimulate the vessel, this is significantly increased. And actually the activated cells are almost more, more adhering when we activate the T cells as well. So this sets us up in a nice place for a model system where we can start to um, put blocking antibodies into the system. So I am going to give this a very preliminary data alert because we've only really sort of done this once or twice. So um, when we add, so in this case we added an IgG control antibody just in case there's anything weird by adding an antibody into the system. Or we added an antibody that blocks ICAM. 
we can actually see this number of adherent cells will significantly drop. So it looks like ICAM in the system is mediating the adhesion of these T cells to the lymphatic vessel. So we're still doing some optimization of the device. There's some play in the, the, uh, the diameter of the resistor. We could also possibly consider, and I'm sorry if this is a dirty word, like transvel, a syringe pump for fluid flow as well. Um, and we want to sort of make sure we can calculate that flow rate so we can um, really see a distinction between the cells that roll and the cells that are rolling, um, as well as of optimizing track mate. So we're just trying to get those last little bits of optimization and then hopefully we can start doing some data collection, we can start using different antibodies, we can potentially knock out some receptors on the endothelial cells, and we can start figuring out how these cells are actually interacting with the endothelium. So then, the last part of the process is extravasation. So believe it or not, Patrick has a device for that. So he has this gradient lumen, which has this very, very long kind of diffusion channel. So when we add a chemo tractant here, it takes about two hours to set up this gradient and get across to the lumen. So we've been using this silica extravasation where we can add our T cells inside the lumen, and then the, our chemokine direction would be over here, and then we form a chemokine gradient. So if our lumen is not TNF stimulated, we don't really see much activity. So maybe one guy made a break for it, but really there's not much extravasation. However, once we add this chemokine gradient, we can begin to see these T cells migrate out of the lumen and um, into the cauldron. We can quantify this. So again, if we don't have any stimulation on the vessels, we get no migration at all. If we have TNF stimulation but no chemokine, we see a little bit of sort of extravasation, and it's in just a completely random direction. If we add chemokine, now we have a directional stimulus. We see the vast majority of the cells going towards the chemokine, although there are a few that work the very much the other way. Um, if we don't add chemokine in the stimulated T cells, we don't see it. And we really don't see a lot of extravasation when you activate the T cells. So this is really, and that makes sense with the literature, it's really more of a naive T cell process where they're being carried through. Um, and then they also go further. So again, if we look at um, the presence of the chemokine and TNF, they actually go um, much longer distances towards the chemokine as well. So we can also start to look at differences in CD4 and CD8 cells, for example. So in this particular blood draw, we label, we purify CD4s and CD8 separately, and then we label them with calcium orange or calcium green. And then we mix them back together at a one-to-one -one ratio, and we pop them into the lumen. And then we gave them a chemokine stimulus, and again, what we actually saw is really the CD4s that are the cells that are actually migrating out of the lumen. The CD8s predominantly just stay inside the lumen. And again, this is very consistent with the literature. It's really CD4 and AU cells is what you're finding. So it turns out CXL12 seems to be the cytokine of choice. So we've run some sort of tests looking at um, individual cytokines, so CXL21, CXL12, CXL6, 3CL1, and a cocktail of them. And really, it seems to be CXL12 that they're responding to. So these are going to. This is going to be the cytokine we're going to focus on going forward. So we see some variation between the lumens, but we're hoping we're going to get a more consistent migration soon. Uh, it might make sense to focus on naive CD4 T cells as they're the ones that have the best kind of migratory potential. And again, hopefully we're going to be ready for data collection soon. So that we can again do our sort of blocking antibody experiments. So here is one against the mannose receptor that you know has a little trend comes down the way we can start looking at what's mediating these um, what's what's actually mediating this extravasation. We can also apply this to cancer cell migration too. So I made some um, GFP variants of the BCAP metastatic lines and the and, uh, um, benign lines that we have. And as we're kind of very interested in the lymph node and prostate cancer metastasis right now, um, we can also look at cancer cell migration through the lymphatic vessels. So here's just the cells, they roll through the lymphatic vessel and then again we can track the rolling and we can see there. And again, we can possibly try and look at some of the receptors involved in interaction <coughs> between the cancer cells. And, um, and the lymphatic vessel, because this is a very a very topical thing in prostate cancer right now. So I'm um, going to say big thanks to Dave and Alice and Pete and to Max and Patrick, who have been equal partners in the project, and everybody else at the MMB. And last but not least, Sophie, my grant writing assistant. <laughs> lots of Here she is helping, helping to write. And she's taking it very seriously. She's now taken to carrying a pen around the house all the time. <laughs> like a so she's, she's really, really taking this seriously and trying. And thank you very much.